Hi, and welcome back to the Georgia Sportsman. Today, we're going to talk about the rifles of Jim Corbett. So if you're into Jim Corbett, India, vintage British rifles, adventures in general, man-eating tigers, this is going to be the episode for you. Jim Corbett was a British citizen who grew up in India. He became a hunter, a tracker, a naturalist, and an author, he, and he's authored several books. Uh, but his biggest repertoire is the fact that he killed a tiger that had killed 436 documented people. Uh, he killed a leopard that had also supposedly killed uh, around 400 people, and a final leopard that killed 126. Those are his highest ones, although he killed a number of tigers and leopards for the Indian government during his tenure. One of the things that especially drew me to Jim Corbett's books is that he writes very matter-of-factly. Uh, in his time period, there are a lot of hunter stories who seem a bit embellished and fanciful, um, and there's no, really no way of validating whether they're true or not. But in the case of Jim Corbett, he did it for the Indian government to to protect villagers, and he's actually kind of underwhelming really in his stories. But even then, the fact that he went out on his own, sending over a dead body for sometimes days at a time, and even weeks at a time, trying to kill a man-eater, could not have been more racking on the nerves, I'm sure. But he really, as a matter of fact, about how he goes about uh, ridding India of these man-eating animals. All right, let's start with the case. This is an original Rigby rifle uh, case. You can see it's obviously no better for the wear. There should be leather straps here, and uh, the case in itself is in need of repair. That'll be for a later project. On top of you see there used to be a leather label. Uh, the initials are still on the case, G.C. Lee's Milne of Wickenhamford Manor. Did a little research on him. He was served in World War II as a lieutenant. Um, haven't been able to find much else, but at least I have a name and the location to dig in further for that. So inside the case, for its age, it's actually uh, still in very good condition. You see an original trade label for the 43 Sackville Street address. They had two slots made where you could put oil and Rangoon bottles. However, they have long been gone, so I took two medicine bottles Created a labeled Rigby's logo on the front, and they fit perfectly into the case. We also have newly manufactured Rigby gun wipes, leather pouch for holding um, jags and cleaning supplies, Got an oil bottle. There's a Rigby logo rifle sling. Here's a ball of Rangoon oil. This stuff is highly uh, viscous. It was used back in the day to really protect guns in high humidity climates such as India. Got a Rigby spelt cleaning cloth. And the 275 Rigby rifle. So according to Rigby's records, this rifle was produced in 1927. Uh, this is the same exact model rifle that Jim Corbett used to kill many of his man-eaters in India, uh, especially tigers and leopards. So this rifle comes with an express sight and two leaf sights. The first sight is marked at 100 yards, the second one 300, and the final one 400 yards. If you're shooting out to 400 yards, you just flip up this leaf sight. And that is the new side that you use to uh, shoot your target. It was also tapped for a scope. Although I prefer to shoot iron sights, at some point I'm sure my eyesight will fail me. And rather than have to give up my rifle, all you have to do is slide the base on there. 
lock it down the opposing hinges, and now you have a three by nine scope. Easily comes off and on. One of the things I love about these rifles is the more you look at them, you just see the elegant simplicity that goes into making these. Uh, there's some really nice touches, like you can see the gold safety on the flag. It balances so incredibly well. I can understand why Jim Corbett used it on so many of his hunts. It is very light, very well balanced, and with a Prince of Wales grip, it is uh, very, very comfortable to shoot. Recoil is about like a 270, um, so no worries there on recoil management with this stock. Although it doesn't have a recoil pad, it definitely doesn't need one. Rigby has recently remade these in the 275, but also some other calibers, and it's called the Highland Stalker. They retail for around $8,000, but they can go much higher depending on what kind of embellishments you desire. This particular one, like I said, was made in 1927 for Manton and Company in Calcutta. It's very well could have gone to India. I wish I knew. Uh, hopefully, if I'm able to research this GC uh, Milne, I'll be able to find more information on whether he actually took it to India for any of his hunts. But it's absolutely strong. Even after all these years, there's nothing wrong with it whatsoever. The 275 Rigby is basically a 7x57. The only difference being that the 7x57 Mauser, which is readily available ammo, shoots a 139 grain bullet, and the 275 Rigby shoots a 140 grain bullet. Uh, I guess that was a way for Rigby to make it more British, but fortunately, it's a common caliber. It's a rock solid uh, Mauser German made gun. This one was made at the Orbendorf factory. And John Rigby made it more British by how they did the stock, some of the nice touches with the gold inletting. And to me, that's a perfect marriage between two ultra reliable companies. Fortunately also, Hornady makes 275 Rigby. Um, I can't recall the cost, but it was not at all burdensome. And the actual cases are marked with the 275 Rigby on the front. So that brings us to our second rifle of Jim Corbett's. The WJ Jeffrey 450-400 Nitro Express, also known as the 400 Jeffrey. This is a 10 and a half pound behemoth uh, used for dangerous game hunting. It also has express sights, same as the Rigby, uh, going from 100, 200, 300, and 400 yards. It has the express sight with a uh, white ivory bead, but it also has a larger flip up sight that covers it for night shooting with an even larger white ivory bead, if you can see that. While this gun is pretty highly embellished, I think that Corbett's actual rifle is even more embellished. But again, got that nice gold touch to it. These shoot a massive 400 grain round. Now, Jim Corbett does mention it from time to time in his books. I think he actually used the Rigby more based off of what I've read of his because it's hard to sit in a mannequin uh, carrying a 10 and a half pound rifle and swing it easily. But this rifle is capable of killing anything that walks on the planet. It is the uh, lower of the Nitro Express rounds. So the recoil on it is actually very manageable. It kicks slightly more than a 30 out six, at least to me, that's the felt recoil. Uh, although it weighs 10 and a half pounds, it is very well balanced. It, uh, it points naturally, which is what the point of a double rifle should be. These are made for close in dirty work. When you may have only a fraction of a second, where you see is where you point and click, uh, much like shotgun shooting. Well, that was a quick overview of Jim Corbett's rifles. Each one is beautiful in its own right, and it served him well in his pursuit of dangerous game in India. If you like my video, please hit the like button. I'd like to hear any comments that you have. And I think even Jim Corbett knew that life is too short to shoot an ugly gun. We'll see y'all next time.